Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Canadian Wildlife Federation's talk of gardening with native plants in Atlantic Canada with Todd Boland. Now, I know that uh, a whole bunch of you are logging on right now, so we'll give you all time to get get uh, get in. And if you want, those of you who are already logged in, feel free to put in the chat where you're from. It's always fun to see where everybody's logging in from. So please feel free to do that. I personally. I'm in Ontario. I'm about half an hour west of Ottawa. That's where I am. But I uh, imagine most of you are in Atlantic Canada. And some will probably be beyond. It'd be fun to see who is. Okay, Nova Scotia, Annapolis Royal, great. St. John's, Moncton, Upper Connecticut. Nova Scotia. I don't know a lot of these places, but my goodness, I can't wait to travel more around the, the Atlantic provinces and explore and find out. Shelburne, Tatamagouche, New Brunswick, Ontario, someone else besides me. <laughs> Lunenburg, St. John's. Oh, that's great. So got a good mix of provinces. I don't see anyone from PEI yet, though. I wonder if we've got anyone from PEI joining us. So um, I'll repeat it again before we start officially, but um, we'll save our questions for the end. And it'd be great if you guys could put all your questions in the Q&A box. And if you're not sure where that is, you simply move your mouse around the screen and hover, and then the, the bar a black bar should appear and you'll see the, the chat which you're typing in now and the Q&A should be right next to it. For those of you who may not be too familiar with Zoom. How are we doing for a time? Got a couple more minutes. So well, let's a few more people log on first. Halifax, someone else from Annapolis Royal. And I bet you've traveled around a fair bit, Todd. So you probably know quite a few of these places. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> I haven't done much traveling in uh, New Brunswick, not as much as I would like. Um, mm. I've been around most of Nova Scotia, and yeah. um, only once was I over on PEI, so there's mm. still lots of PEI for me to ex to explore at this stage. <laughs> in that one chunk of Canada, there's, so, again, so many wonderful places to explore. Yeah. All right. So people are still logging on. So what we've said is if you'd like, as you log on, please share with us. Well, oh, someone's in Moncton, Niagara Falls, oh great. And Il Madame. If, as you're logging on, please feel free to share with us where you're from. And uh, it's kind of fun to see, see where everybody's joining us from. Hello from St. John's, hello. All right. So let's see what other housekeeping we can talk about. Um, yeah, so everybody, in case you're new to the webinar concept where everybody's muted and you, no one's screen is on, so we're only gonna be communicating through the chat and then questions at the very end with the Q&A. Hey, from Lindenburg, Kleinberg, Ontario, Nova Scotia, great. <laughs> and remember, in case some of you have typed it, um, you can choose for everyone to see it or just the hosts and panelists, which would be myself, and Todd. So some of you have said it just to us, which is fine, but you can choose an option when you're typing in the chat too. You can choose hosts and panelists, or you can choose everyone. New Brunswick, North Scotia. Okay, that's great. So let's see how we're doing for the time. Okay, I think, I think we have um, a lot of people joining us right now, and we are on time. So I'm going to get started. Um, but before we do, uh, I'd like to first acknowledge that I personally am on the unceded and surrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation and that I respect the inherent and treaty rights of all Indigenous peoples in this land and beyond. And I think it's quite perfect actually because we have our Gardening for Wildlife program, which is putting on this webinar, and we, we are all doing our best to work with nature and respect nature, which is something the Indigenous people have been doing for centuries. So it's wonderful that we're all doing our best together in our own corners of the country. So I am Sarah Colber. I've been with the Canadian Wildlife Federation for about 20 years now. And if you're not familiar with the Canadian Wildlife Federation, we're a national not-for-profit organization and we're actually celebrating our 60th anniversary this year. 
And what we do is um, in a variety of ways is help conserve our wild spaces and our wildlife for the enjoyment of all. So we do this by working with policymakers. We do re research in the field and events like this where we're working with people to share information so they can discover our incredible wildlife and wild plants, appreciate them and support them. So enough about me, I'm going to actually introduce our speaker, Todd, now. I think that's all I have to go through. And if you are late joining, I'm just been telling everybody, we'll put all our questions in the Q&A for the end of the presentation. And um, in the chat, please feel free to tell us where you're from. So oh, one more thing too, this talk will be recorded. So there will be a follow-up Zoom email that you'll get with a link to the recording, as well as some other helpful links that uh, that I might think of along the way that can be useful to you. So I'm gonna introduce our guest, Todd Boland, who I'm so, so, so happy has agreed to do this talk. He's the perfect person for this. And I've been looking forward to this talk myself. Um, Todd is the horticulturalist at the Memorial University of Newfoundland Botanical Garden. He's the vice president of the North American Rock Garden Society. I had to write this all down because I didn't want to forget there was so much to say. He's an executive member of the Newfoundland and Labrador Wildflower Society, and he's lectured and written on various aspects of horticulture and native plants internationally. In 2020, he joined uh, the editorial board of the magazine, Canada's Local Gardener. And he's got many books out, seven books, I believe in all. Uh, some are photographic field guides of wildflowers and woody plants of the Atlantic provinces, and some are gardening books. And I think Todd, you have um, one in the printing phase on gardening with acidic soil and two other gardening books that you have out on perennials and shrubs and vines also for Atlantic Canada. So uh, I'll perhaps tell us a bit more about that at the end of his talk, but right now I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna mute myself and hand this over to Todd. Thank you very much. Okay, can everybody see the screen? I don't see your video, your presentation yet. Oh, okay. What's going on here? Um, we, we had practiced this. <laughs> there we go. There we, go. <laughs> we did. We did practice. We're great. All right. I can see your PowerPoint now. Great. So I'm going to stop my video and I'm going to meet myself and over you. What's going on here? I can't seem to get to the start screen because I got things in my way here. Hmm. No, I see your PowerPoint presentation. It just wasn't in the slideshow mode. Yeah, I'm just trying to. So it from, oh, here we go. From beginning. For it to, so I need to, to click it twice because it's actually click once in the window and then once. Ah. Actually, there we go. Works okay. perfect now. OK. <clears throat> All right. So I've, I've already skipped one thing ahead. <laughs> all right. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be speaking to you this evening, talk to you all about gardening for wildlife. Um, and as Sarah mentioned, the emphasis here this evening is on gardening, specifically within Atlantic Canada. Now, we are a large area, so there is a bit of a caveat here that I will be introducing plants that are not necessarily found throughout all the Atlantic Canada. Um, Newfoundland, we are a little bit further as you know, further north, further east. And we do have, uh, we'll say, less diversity of flora here than in the maritime provinces. So as I'm going through and I'm mentioning different plants, um, I'll make a note saying not NL, okay? So in other words, that species is not native to Newfoundland. That's not to say that it's not a good, um, we'll say, uh, a North American native plant to use in your garden. It's just that this particular plant is not native within the province of Newfoundland Labrador. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to talk about a wide variety of plants, both uh, woody plants, trees, shrubs, herbaceous plants as well. It will not be all encompassing. Okay, so there will be, you know, you may say, oh, you never mentioned such and such. And, you know, you have an hour and it's so many, there's so many great plants to choose from. So I'm selecting those plants that are, that I've had experience with and that I know are what we'll call the garden good guys, okay? Because while native plants are wonderful to use in the garden, some of them can be bullies. And especially when they get into a good garden soil situation, they can really run rampantly compared to what they would uh, in the wild where they're a little bit more restricted because of the soil conditions and whatnot. 
So I'm trying to avoid those. I don't want you to be introducing a plant that later on you're going to say, oh my gosh, why did you tell me to introduce that? And, you know, it's, it's become an absolute pest. And even some of the ones I might mention this evening might be a little bit temperamental in regards to becoming a little bit of a pest. But, you know, you judge yourself accordingly. <laughs> okay, so if we're going to be gardening for wildlife, there are a few basics to keep in mind first. First and foremost, of course, is all about food. It's all about groceries, okay? And same as ourselves, when we decide where we're going to live in a particular community or within a particular city, oftentimes we're looking at where's the closest grocery store, okay? Um, so it's all about groceries. So for the animals and for the plants or for the birds and, and the insects out there, it's all about the groceries as well, okay? So in the case of the insects, it's primarily uh, access to nectar and pollen. Um, and for birds, it's gonna be access to seeds and berries. Now, of course, hummingbirds would fall into the nectar category as being a little bit of a, an outlier. And I'm not really getting into squirrels and raccoons and skunks and things like that. Um, most of us probably don't want those in our garden. A lot of us probably don't want deer um, in our garden or moose here in Newfoundland. Um, and we have moose here in the botanical garden and they're the bane of my existence. So I'm basically sticking to birds, gardening for birds and gardening for our pollinators. Okay, so food. Water, we all need water, our cells included. So in the case of your garden, it could be installation of a bird bath. Uh, birds will obviously use that, but butterflies uh, and even um, honeybees, if you have a, happen to have a honeybee hive, they'll oftentimes go to a bird bath um, and to drink as well. Or alternatively, you can introduce some sort of water feature, be it a little garden pool, um, <clears throat> preferably with a little bit of a waterfall or a fountain so the water's not stagnant because we don't want West Nile um, as being a, becoming a problem in our gardens. Then we need protection, okay? In the case of insects, they're cold-blooded, so they're not particularly active in really open, windy sites, so they need a little bit of shelter. Um, in the case of birds, of course, they have predators that may be attacking them, so they like a little bit of cover. And then lastly, a place to raise the offspring. Now, in the case of birds, of course, most of the trees and shrubs that we have that are natives are, are the natural nesting sites for these birds. Um, in the case of insects, it's a, a matter of planting some of the host plants, especially when it comes to uh, butterflies, because butterflies have a complex life history. What the adults are feeding on is not necessarily what their larvae are feeding on, okay? So you may want to introduce some host plants. Um, and one thing to keep in mind when it comes to butterflies, all of our native butterflies only host on native plants for the most part. So they're not gonna become a problem, say, you know, oh, I have an ornamental plant in my garden, or oh, our morning clothes gonna end up destroying that, or are the red admirals gonna destroy that? No, the only problematic butterfly that's gonna attack your garden are the European cabbage white butterfly, which are introduced. <clears throat> okay, so tips for attracting wildlife. Use a mix of flowers in a wide variety of colors. Um, utilize dense shrubs as cover for the birds, keep the birds happy. As I mentioned, incorporate water into your landscape. Um, if you are using a water feature, incorporate aquatic plants. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about those later on. Uh, incorporate nesting boxes for certain birds, especially those that are cavity nesters. Um, those that just make open nests like robins and, um, and warblers, they're gonna go into the trees and to the shrubs. But things like the chickadees and the woodpeckers, um, if you don't have any old rotten trees on your property, well then nest boxes will be very useful for them. And think about 12 months of the year when you're selecting your plants. Um, it's not just about the, uh, the growing season, okay? Use compost in your garden. We don't wanna be using a lot of chemical fertilizers for the most part for wildlife. Um, we don't want birds down, you know, pecking at the ground, looking for a bit of grit and then accidentally ingesting chemical fertilizer granular fertilizer. So use compost to incorporate a few host plants into it. And of course, we want to avoid pesticides, all right? Because one pesticide is generally, most of them are very, very broad ranging. And not only are the pesticides going to impact the insects, but it's going to impact the birds that may be feeding on the insects. And if your garden is really well balanced, you have a good variety of plants and everything's growing really well, basically insects and birds will have natural balance between them. So you won't have big, bad um, insect outbreaks, okay? The birds will help to keep them under control. And of course, there's lots of beneficial 
um, insects out there as well that help to keep our problematic insects at bay. So water features, as I mentioned, um, if, you have, if you have the space, incorporate them. Birds will use for drinking and bathing. Can attract dragonflies and butterflies, or dragonflies and damselflies. They'll eat lots of mosquitoes and blackflies. They're garden good guys, okay? They'll introduce frogs. Frogs will feed on slugs and things like that in your garden, okay? So that's a good thing. So <clears throat> a nice, simple little garden pool. You're, we're using a liner here. We're putting in different native grasses around the perimeter, utilizing aquatic plants within the pond itself. That'll keep the frogs and their tadpoles happy. It also provides a place then for the birds to land on that vegetation to go for a drink. Um, provides a landing platform for the insects as well. So here's a, a blue flag iris, your dragonfly. And, you're, and if you have a water feature, more than likely you're going to have dragonflies and damselflies. Okay. And as I mentioned, they're the garden good guys. You want those. And we put a garden, um, a water feature in our botanical garden. We never introduced frogs. They found it on their own. Okay. So if you're, you know, either a bit close to any kind of a natural water feature, more than likely, and you put one in your garden, more than likely the frogs are going to, or the toads are going to end up finding it for you. Okay. So now down in our pools, uh, we have the tadpoles down there. Okay, so why are the advantages using native plants? Wildlife is familiar, okay? It's plants that, that your, your uh, wildlife in your area are gonna be used to seeing on a regular basis. Um, <clears throat> most butterfly host plants are native, not exotic, okay? So if you want to incorporate host plants into your garden, you're gonna to want to introduce some native plants. A lot of native plants are carefree when it comes to pests and diseases, okay? A lot of our hybrid ornamental plants may look really wonderful, but they're sort of almost like a desert, okay? Um, <clears throat> a number of the plant, new plants these days don't even offer nectar or pollen, okay? So they really are deserts. And of course, a lot of them are very hybrid, so they're prone to a number of different types of insects, which you're not gonna have as many problems when you're growing your, your native stuff instead. So we're gonna start talking about specifically insects, and then I'm gonna go into the birds. So attracting insect pollinators, butterflies and hoverflies. Hoverflies are what we call surfeit flies. People think they're wasps. They're just mimicking wasps, okay, to protect themselves. But they're garden good guys. The insects themselves, the adults, are great pollinators, and their larvae actually feed on aphids, okay? So you got to, it's a win-win situation. So butterflies and hoverflies, they're attracted to yellow, orange, and red flowers in particular. Butterflies prefer flowers with a landing platform, okay? They don't hover generally when they're feeding. They like to land on the, on the flower to feed. So they like those that have a, a flat flower, basically your daisies, any kind of daisies will be uh, great plants for butterflies. Bees, on the other hand, they seem to be more attractive to pink, purple, and blue. And that's a great feature because that way it's putting bees and butterflies not so much at direct competition with each other, okay? Especially white flowers. White flowers are sort of generalists and they're sort of come one, come all. Um, but if you have a, a flower that's specific, say, to uh, bumblebee or bee pollination, they're oftentimes purple and blue because those are the most uh, preferred colors for these, for these particular insects. Uh, bees will tolerate more shade and wind than butterflies. So if you have a windy garden, maybe you want to think more on the butterfly side of, or bee side of things, whereas if your garden is a little bit more sheltered, well, then you may be able to plant more on the, uh, for the butterflies. <clears throat> now, bees see color quite different from us. Butterflies have very similar uh, color receptors to our cells. So they see colors much the same way we do. Bees, on the other hand, not quite so. Bees see into the ultraviolet. So here I have a potent teleflower. Um, on the left, plain yellow. Yellow is a good color for butterflies, not so much for bees, but that flower to a bee has got that red center with a white edge. It's a bullseye, basically advertising to the bee. It's the center of the flower where you're, in, where you're going to get the nectar and where you're going to get the pollen. Here's a crocus, okay, here in Newfoundland, they're flowering now, they're probably finished now in, in most maritimes. So here's your crocus to our eyes, it's basically a little purple crocus, and look at it from a bee's eye point of view. It is quite striking, okay? That is gonna be a bullseye for any bees flying around your neighborhood, they're gonna find, find the crocus flowers. Now, so we'll talk about native wildflowers for pollinators, and we're gonna talk about meadow plants. So these are perennial plants that prefer sun, okay? So nice sunny open areas. Um, <clears throat> here's the list, I'm gonna go into each one specifically, okay? And you'll notice here that bone set, 
It's not found in Newfoundland. Common milkweed is not native to Newfoundland. It's also a host plant besides being attractive for, for um, pollen and nectar. And blue vervain is not in Newfoundland. Okay, so asters. We have lots of aster species here in Atlantic Canada. Uh, this one particular one here is New York aster, which is oftentimes found near the coast. It's a very good coastal plant. <clears throat> this is what they call uh, the flat-topped aster, which, which is one of the few white-flowered species, quite tall. And New York, our New England aster. So New England aster is not native to Newfoundland, but it is native to the rest of the Maritimes. But all these asters are great in the fall of the year. They are going to help to attract the late emerging butterflies, and they're going to be also good for any of the bees that are basically trying to get a last ditch effort to feed before winter sets in. Here is a hoverfly. Okay, so I mentioned them. They're a garden good guy. They look like a wasp. They only have one set of wings. Wasps have two sets of wings. They also have an extremely short, you can see my mouse, a very, very short antennae on surfeit flies. Wasps, on the other hand, have quite long antennae. Okay, so those are some of the features between them. And hoverflies will hover, okay, above a flower. Um, but they like similar flowers to what butterflies like. And they obviously like asters as well. Here is a Milbert's tortoise shell. It's one of the summer uh, emerging butterflies feeding on one of the earlier flowering asters. Then we go into the golden rods. Lots of species of those as well. Some are short, most are on the taller side of things. They don't cause hay fever. Okay, they get a bad rap for doing that, but it's, it's other types of weeds that do that. Uh, they don't produce that much free flying uh, pollen. So lots of variety, golden rods, basically they're all yellow. Okay, and again, they're flowering mid to late summer. So very good for those late emerging butterflies, as well as the, the bees. Here we have morning cloak. We have a Dorcas copper, okay, feeding on um, a bog goldenrod on the right-hand side. The morning cloak is feeding on lance leaf goldenrod. And here is Painted Lady feeding on lance leaf goldenrod. Back to our surfid flies again, the drone flies, as they're also known as. Okay, so drone flies, hover flies, or surfid flies. And bumblebees. There's actually a wasp because wasps are pollinators too. It's just unfortunate that wasps are temperamental, okay? And you know, you don't necessarily need to aggravate them for them to sting you. Whereas bumblebees, the last thing in the world they want to do is sting you, okay? I mean, we're working in the botanical garden. I've been working here now 16 years. I've never, I'm knocking on my desk for wood, have ever been stung by a bumblebee. Actually, I've never been stung by a honeybee either, and we have two hives here. So, you know, don't worry about it. Um, Black-eyed Susan. Again, we're back to daisies. Daisies are just great pollinator plants. And most daisies love the sun. So they're great meadow plants, okay? Now there's lots of hybrid varieties of Black-Eyed Susan out there. The ones I'm showing you here are close to the wild form. Bone set, not in Newfoundland. Um, it is a, a white flowered aster, very dense, albeit very small flowers, but in a dense head. So it does offer lots of flowers in a small space. Here's a red admiral feeding on bone set. Um, and this is another type of drone fly. Okay, um, feeding on a bone set. Canada burnet oftentimes grows sort of along the edges of roadside ditches or along streams. It likes moist soil uh, as opposed to really dry soil. Flowering mid to late summer. <clears throat> and here it is growing in our rock garden at the Botanical Garden. It's a great ornamental plant, even though it's native. And look at that foliage, it's that beautiful glaucous blue foliage. It's really a plant that's quite outstanding in the garden landscape. Um, and a lot of people come to the garden and think, oh, where can I buy that plant? It's like, you don't have to buy it. <laughs> it grows wild here. And people are quite amazed by that. Okay, so it's quite an attractive flower island as well. And it makes a good cut flower. Okay, milkweed. Now we all know the plate, or most of us hopefully know the plate of the poor old monarch butterflies. We don't have monarchs in Newfoundland. They do turn up here after storms um, in the fall of the year, but we're at the end of the line. Uh, we don't have any milkweed plants here for them to, uh, to use as a host plant. And they will also, the adults will al also feed on the flowers, um, the nectar from the milkweed. So, you know, I tell people here in Newfoundland, you know, don't wor worry about planting milkweed 
for our butterflies because none of our native butterflies use it, but they certainly do use it in the Maritimes, okay? Um, and here she is, okay, doing what monarchs do with milkweed. Fireweed, now this is one that can be a bit of a bully, okay? So it's more or less for those that have lots of space in their gardens. Um, it's a very showy plant. Uh, hummingbirds will feed on it as well. But, um, it, you know, it's, it's a great pollinator plant in particular, not so much for butterflies, but certainly lots of different types of bees will use it, as well as honeybees. Blue vervain, not found in Newfoundland, okay, um, it's sort of a mid to late summer flowering plant. And here is one of the uh, summer, cop or summer azures, um, one of the little blue butterflies uh, feeding on the, the blossoms of the blue vervain. And this is what you're going to try to grow. This is what you're going to try to recreate in your garden, okay? You're going to try to recreate a meadow garden. Now, in this particular meadow garden here, most of the material here is native, but there may be some more ornamental, uh, exotic plants as well. And by all means, you can mix and match, okay? No one says you have to use 100% native material. Um, and the whole, basically, the, the idea I'm trying to get across here is to incorporate those, not necessarily replace them all, because some of the exotics are also great plants for wildlife, okay? And not all are going to necessarily be prone to insect or to pests and diseases and things like that. We just basically want to avoid the really hybrid ornamental plants. Let's sort of stick to those that are a little bit closer to their wild ancestors, okay? So in this case here, the white you see here is actually a companion. It's not native, but it still blends in nice with the other ornamental plants and still creates a nice pleasing effect um, for a roadside meadow garden. Okay, now, what about if you have shade? Okay, and a lot of us have great big monster uh, maple trees or whatever, or spruce or fir um, <clears throat> in our gardens. And you say, well, I don't have a sunny garden. I can't grow meadow plants, so what can I do? Well, there are plants also that are good for, for woodland situations. <coughs> Excuse me. And again, this is a short list. There's lots, and you'll see lots of not an NL here, okay? But they are beautiful plants, and we grow all these in our botanical garden here. Um, and when they're blended with our native um, woodland plants, it really makes it for a lovely, pleasing effect. One thing to note here is that violets, the native violets, act as a host plant for a couple of species of butterfly. Okay, so we have different varieties of, of violets here in Atlantic Canada, and the flowers are either going to be this purpley blue color, um, different shades of purple and blue, or they may be white, okay? Um, some like it moist, some are a little bit more tolerant to drier conditions. Trillium. Now, white trillium is very, very rare in Nova Scotia, and not particularly common in New Brunswick either. Uh, the red trillium is far more widespread. Neither one of those are found in Newfoundland but they're an absolutely wonderful woodland plant to use anywhere in Atlantic Canada. I can't say enough nice things about trillium. And here's the red trillium or the, the red uh, wake robin. Bloodroot, I, it's unfortunate we don't have it in the plant. I love this plant. The flowers only last for like three days. <laughs> you know, they're very short lived, but when they're in bloom um, here in the garden, the honeybees go mad after it. So it's a good source of pollen in particular on those. And when the flowers just sort of pop up through those clasping leaves, I mean, it's just such an ornamental looking plant, even if it is relatively short-lived. Um, hepaticas, not in Newfoundland, uh, but it is in the Maritimes. And the flowers in the hepaticas, which are blooming now, um, <clears throat> can be pink, it may be blue, but the most common color is white, okay? But from a garden perspective, for the more ornamental ones, the ones we grow here in the garden are the pinks and, and the blue. Um, corn lily. It's a great ground cover plant for a shady area. You can actually eat the leaves, okay? So it's, it's a plant you can forage with. It'll bloom in late May, early June. These sort of uh, yellow, yellowish green, little lily-like flowers, great for, for nectaring. Uh, hummingbirds will feed on these as well. The one caveat, is that they have these gorgeous berries in the fall of the year, but those berries are poisonous, okay? So if you have small children, you may not want these around. Um, I've never known dogs to eat them. Slugs do love them, 
but believe it or not, slugs can eat away at the berries and it doesn't seem to affect them whatsoever. Uh, trout lilies, not in Newfoundland. They're flowering now or about to come into bloom. Um, it's the American trout lily, which is found throughout Atlanta, uh, the Maritimes. Um, beautiful mottled foliage and these beautiful lily-like flowers. Again, good for hummingbirds, um, <clears throat> but also good for hummingbird hawk moths, um, as well as different types of bees. False Solomon seal, masses of white flowers, all densely clustered together there. Great source of nectar um, and pollen as well. Twisted stalk, you can get rose twisted stalk and you can get white twisted stalk. Flowers are only small, but they are um, fed upon by hummingbirds again um, and by various species of moths, or I'm um, sorry, uh, bees. And here's the white twisted stalk. And foam flower, another one not found in Newfoundland. So you have the advantage in, in the Maritimes that you have a lot of deciduous hardwood forests, which we really don't have here in Newfoundland. So because we have spruce and fir, it's very, very dense shade and we don't get that great diversity of um, spring woodland wildflowers like you do in, Atlanta, in uh, the rest of the Maritimes. <clears throat> and this is the kind of effect you can have, okay? Woodland gardens work best under deciduous trees that allow a bit of sun to come in in the spring of the year. Um, and you have different types of um, spring anemones and trilliums and, and whatnot that can be growing under those circumstances, okay? So if you happen to have a few large trees, don't bother with a lawn. Basically try to, to, to recreate a woodland garden. <clears throat> now, maybe you have a wetland spot. Okay, a lot of us have, have the opportunity to put in a water feature. So here are all the various water kind of plants you can grow. Here's Joe Pieweed, big, bold plant, loves the moist soil. Um, purple flowers, bees love it, butterflies love it. Blue flag iris, really it's a bee flower more so than butterflies. Okay, and the bees will crawl their way down inside the blossoms to get access to the pollen and the nectar. Pickerel weed, not in Newfoundland, but it's another great one for bees. Again, it's blue. Okay, think blue, blue and bees. Marsh marigolds, they'll be flowering now pretty soon. And like here's a wetland area, just masses and masses of uh, marsh marigolds. And that's actually in a private garden in uh, Nova Scotia. Okay, so you can recreate this common kind of effect right here in Atlanta, Canada. Uh, jewelweed, it's an annual, okay, it's unusual. We don't have too many native annuals um, in Atlanta, Canada, but jewelweed is one. And bees love it and hummingbirds love it. So once you have a plant, let it self seed and you'll always have little ones popping up around the garden. They become a pest, you just pull out what you don't want. Turtle head, it's really a bee flower. This has really been a plant, a flower that's adapted to bee pollination. And the bumblebees will just sort of crawl their way down inside the flower there to get access to the pollen and the nectar. Uh, purple stemmed aster is a specific type of aster that generally grows in really, really wet uh, ditches um, or in shallow edges of ponds and streams. And being an aster, it's good for butterflies and bees. <clears throat> Think aquatic as well, white water lilies, okay? and um, I've seen ducks feeding on the seeds of these. I mean, we're probably not going to be attracting ducks to our garden because they don't want larger bodies of water than what we can afford uh, for the most part. But bees love just all the pollen. These water lily flowers are just packed with pollen. So oftentimes it's, you will even out in the wild see the center of these flowers just covered and crawling with, uh, with bees. Bog bean, another great sort of ground cover for wet areas. And nothing has such an exotic flower. You really need to get up close and, and personal with bog bean flowers just to see that intricate beauty within the flowers there. I mean, it does worth the relish just sitting down and staring at this for a while to really appreciate it. And <clears throat> this is what we create in our gardens, okay? So water features are pretty easy to do. Here we have irises, we have a bit of pickerel weed. Um, in this case, the water lily is an exotic one that could easily be replaced with the native white water lily to create the same kind of an effect. And here we have white water lily. Now you will see here it's yellow flag iris. I'm not encouraging you to use that because that's an invasive species. Just replace that with blue flag and you're all set. Okay, so when we're talking about the bees and the butterflies, we also have our, our feathered friends, okay? So how are we going to attract our birds? And I already did mention a little bit about that. 
provide cover in the form of evergreens or dense shrubs so they can feel a little bit more protected um, against any kind of predators that are coming their way. Nest boxes, especially for chickadees, swallows, um, and woodpeckers in particular, because these are all cavity nesters. Now, feeding the birds. Of course, now we have this avian uh, flu that's on the go. So we're telling people not to be feeding the birds right now. <clears throat> and really, you don't need to be feeding this time of year. There's, there's enough natural food out there for them. But they certainly benefit in the middle of the winter um, <clears throat> in order to keep these birds around. Okay. So seed and suet from fall to spring. You want to avoid cornmeal. Um, there's not a lot of birds outside of morning doves and rats and mice and, and squirrels uh, that will go after the cornmeal. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The number one seed though to use is black oil sunflower. Okay, we don't provide anything else, provide black oil sunflower because most seed eating birds will go after that. Plant berry producing trees and shrubs, especially those that have orange or reddish orange colored fruit. Okay, our birds here in North America that are fruit eaters are sort of hardwired, uh, hardwired to go after berries that are red or orange in color. And that could be an exotic plant like holly berries. Uh, or a native plant like mountain ash and various viburnums. <clears throat> and then a source of water is also very helpful. <clears throat> so here are some examples of some of the bird boxes. One problem, of course, is going to be house sparrows and starlings. Um, so make, you, know, you can go online and get information about how large that entrance hole should be, because the birds that utilize these boxes, the chickadees and the swallows, um, are, are smaller in, st in stature than, swallow, uh, than uh, house sparrows and starlings. So it's important to have that, that hole small enough that it basically precludes um, starlings in particular from going in there. Tray feeders, black oil sunflower will attract the, the blue jays during the winter months. Um, <clears throat> seed bells, chickadees will go after those. Niger seed, great for any of the finches. Here you can see red poles, uh, American goldfinch and pine siskins all in the one seed bag. <clears throat> with woodpeckers, all you have to do is smear a bit of peanut butter on the trunk of a tree, and they'll, they'll love you forever. Now, in the, of course, in the Maritimes these days, you have cardinals. Um, we're still waiting for them in Newfoundland, and, and every year now, we seem to get a record or two, uh, and hopefully in time, we'll have enough that a breeding pair will get established here, but they're just a wonderful bird to see around um, during the winter months. And as I mentioned with the bird baths, Basically, any kind of birds will use those. Okay, so here we have cardinal and robin both going into the bird bath. Now, whew, long list. Okay, don't get overwhelmed here. <clears throat> so these are shrubs specifically. We have lots of shrubs in Atlantic Canada, which are great plants uh, for birds. Some of them are good for bees and butterflies as well. Okay, so they sort of provide uh, multi purposes. Okay, in the garden, so they can be providing nectar pollen, could be fruit, could be nesting sites, or and or a host plant, okay? So here's your long list here. I'm gonna give you an opportunity at the end. Um, I'm gonna do a recap <clears throat> and you'll be able to um, just take a picture with your phone of that list, okay? And that way then you'll have it on your phone and then you can transfer it accordingly because I know it's a lot of information here I'm giving you this evening. Okay, chokeberries. We have black and purple here in Atlantic Canada. It's a great landscape shrub. Masses of white flowers um, with the pink stamens, very, very attractive plant. Big clusters of black or purple um, berries, which the birds will eat, and also spectacular fall color. Service berries, I think there's like six to seven species here in Atlantic Canada. They're getting ready to bloom now any moment. Um, <clears throat> again, lots of white flowers, great for the pollinators, great bushes for warblers and things like that to nest in as well. Um, and you get edible berries, even better. Birds will eat them. You'll try to eat them yourselves. The birds will probably beat you to it, okay? Um, so it, it's a great, it's a native plant that provides benefits for us as well as for wildlife. Northern wild raisin, it's a viburnum, type of viburnum. Again, lovely cluster of flowers, very, very attractive, beautiful fall color. And the berries go from green to white to pink to finally blackish blue 
you know, so you just look at this at the halfway phase. The leaves are starting to turn. Some of the fruit are still pink. Some of them are turning purpley blue. It's just such a great ornamental plant um, to put into your garden. High bush cranberry, another wonderful plant. Beautiful foliage. In the fall of the year, it's scarlet red, uh, almost maple-like leaves. You get these beautiful white flowers. Um, <clears throat> and then later in the fall, you get edible berries again. Okay, so it's a toss up between you or the pine grosbeaks, which love the berries on this. And here's Mr. Pine Gro or Mrs. Pine Grosbeak in this case, feeding on the berries from the high bush cranberry. Hobble bush, another viburnum, not found in Newfoundland. Um, superficially, it looks very similar to the high bush cranberry. And they'll be flowering pretty soon now. They're coming along pretty far. And then they'll also have berries that will go from red to sort of a purpley black color um, when they're fully ripe. And also good fall color. Um, some of the dogwoods. We have three different types of dogwood. Uh, the red osier is the most widespread. Pagoda is the biggest one, very rare in Newfoundland, much more common in, land, in, in Maritimes. And then there's the round leaf dogwood, which is not found in Newfoundland, but is found throughout the Maritimes. So the dogwoods, white clusters of flowers um, early in the season. And then they'll develop primarily into white colored berries. Sometimes berries can be sort of blue tinted as well. And also have pretty good fall color. Currants, wild currant. We have swamp, skunk, and bristly um, in particular. They're not floral knockouts. Hummingbirds do like them though, okay? And birds will eat the fruit. And the fruit are actually edible for us as well, except for the skunk currant, which is a bit, bit pungent, <laughs> lives up to its name, okay? So here's a skunk currant uh, berries. Like I said, for us, leave them for the wildlife. You're better off. Uh, the bristly black um, currant, it's really too bristly for us, but the birds don't seem to mind the bristles. Red elderberry. The berries on this are just a Shangri-La, in particular for robins. Robins will literally get drunk because when the, by the time the berries are ripe on here, they're starting to ferment a little bit. Um, and robins will actually start flying into other bushes and fly into buildings and everything uh, here in the garden when, they, when they're really gorging themselves on the red elderberry. But it's a really ornamental shrub. So it's beautiful foliage, beautiful clusters of these sort of creamy white flowers. And their fruit, are, their berries are amongst the earliest to ripen. So even by the end of July, the fruit are already ripe. Whereas most of our, our berry producing shrubs don't ripen their fruit until well into September, even not, if not October. And here's the robin hiding out there, feeding on these little berries. Like I said, if you want to attract robins to your garden in late summer, grow red elderberry. Wild roses. We have Carolina, Virginia, and swamp. Now, Car uh, Carolina is not here in Newfoundland, but the Virginia and the swamp is. Um, the other three are all throughout the, the Maritimes. So wild roses, they do sucker. They may spread a little bit, but the flowers are super fragrant. We can eat the blossoms. You can eat the fruit, the rose hips. You can use those in teas and whatnot. So it's a good plant for foraging purposes. But of course, wildlife will use it as well. Bees love the blossoms. They get lots of pollen off of these. Um, <clears throat> here's a honeybee feeding on, on the flowers of the, of the native wild roses. And then we get the hips. Uh, the hips will be taken by fruit eating birds. And uh, so the wax wings, uh, pine gross beaks, those kind of things will feed on, on the hips. Now, they'll go to mountain ash and elderberry and viburnums quicker, more quickly because the berries on uh, or the hips on roses are a bit large. But by the end of the winter, when the fruit have gotten sort of frosted, um, they get a little bit softer, and then you will see some of these fruit-eating birds picking away at the fruit um, of the wild roses. Meadowsweet. This is really a plant for pollinators. Bees love it. Butterflies love it. Here's a morning array red admiral feeding on, a, on the bitter on the summer sweet, um, meadowsweet. But birds, in particular juncos, will feed on the seeds in the fall of the year when the seeds are ripe. Okay, so it's good for wildlife as well. Shrubby syncofoil. A ubiquitous garden plant. The landscape industry is smothered in these. Yellow is the wild color form, even though the ornamental varieties come in whites, orange, pink, red. Uh, but it's the yellow, which is the wild color form. This one here is just a wild one um, photographed in the wild. So the flowers in this are good for bees. 
in particular. Um, and you'll get a lot of these little small bees, not necessarily the big bumblebees or honeybees. You have all these little solitary bees and they're only little tiny little things. And we just sort of ignore them, but they're very, very important pollinators, especially when it comes to a lot of our fruit, in particular, um, blueberries. Okay, and we all know how important blueberries are in Nova Scotia in particular, uh, with, with huge blueberry farms. Um, but they're cropping up now throughout Atlantic Canada. And it's these little tiny bees that do a lot of the pollinating on those. So they're important to attract to our gardens as well. Uh, mountain maple, it's the seeds, the flowers, the pollinators will go after, but some of the birds, things like uh, the evening grosbeaks will feed on the seeds of these during the fall of the year. And we have striped maple, which is the moosewood. We have mountain maple. Uh, striped maple is not in the flat. I forgot to mark that in there. Willows, lots of different species of willow. And it's the, um, in particular, the male willows that produce lots of pollen. Very, very important food source for their early emerging butterflies and for the bees when they come out of hibernation because it's oftentimes the only plant that's in bloom um, at the time. Okay, so a really, really important plant in the spring of the year for certain. Here is a uh, green comma feeding on the, the willow catkins in the spring of the year. Staghorn sumac, this is a good plant for its fruit production and grouse and pheasant will feed on the fruit of the sumacs. Beautiful fall color as well. It's hard to beat this plant for its fall, for its fall show color. Trees, okay, so we talked about shrubs. What are some of the trees? Um, and again, they're gonna provide nectar, pollen, fruit, nesting sites, and or could be a host plant, okay? Um, a long list of those. And you don't need to be growing Norway maple. Oh my gosh, keep away from Norway maple. It's such a bad invasive species. You know, if you want a maple in your garden, grow red maple or grow sugar maple, okay? Um, and it'll provide the same aspect as Norway maple, but it's native. Mountain ash. If you're only going to grow one tree in your garden that's going to be good for wildlife, it's a mountain ash, okay? Because the flowers are good for pollinators. The bees will love it, all the pieces. Butterflies, to a lesser degree, will feed on it as well. But it's the berry production. And all the fruit-eating birds, robins, waxwings, um, even purple finches. I've seen juncos feeding on the berries of mountain ash. It is probably the number one native tree to grow in your garden. Pine grosbeak feeding on it. Robins feeding on the, on the mountain ash. Bohemian waxwings, they're only visiting us in the winter, but they're gonna take advantage anytime you have mountain ash berries. Hawthorns, several species in the, mar in the maritimes. We only have two here in Newfoundland, they're pretty rare. Um, the fruit can be bright red or they can be black. The flowers, good pollinator plants. The berries, good for the fruit eaters, okay? And again, in particular, robins. The fruit are pretty big. The robins don't seem to have any problem with them. Choke cherry, great ornamental plant. You got these beautiful um, nodding clusters of white flowers. It almost looks like a golden chain tree that's white as opposed to yellow. So very attractive flowers. You're gonna get those beautiful uh, fruit. It's not so edible for us, they're, they're pretty insipid, but certainly the fruit eating birds will love it. Black cherry, very, very closely related, not found in Newfoundland. Um, choke cherry is in Newfoundland and throughout Atlantic Canada, black cherry is only in the Maritimes. But otherwise it's a plant that looks very, very similar. Clusters of white flowers followed by um, clusters of blackish purple berries. Pin cherry throughout, Again, great pollinator plant in the spring of the year when they're blooming, and they'll be blooming within the next couple of weeks. And of course, the berries on those will be eaten by the fruit eating birds as well. Also beautiful fall color on this. So it makes it an, an ornamental tree. Birch, paper birch, gray birch, gray birch and yellow. We don't have gray in Newfoundland. Uh, paper and yellow is found throughout. Very ornamental year round, especially in the winter, we can take advantage of this beautiful bark in our gardens. But the birds will take advantage of that because it's a great nesting site. Uh, these are yellow birch here. Uh, this is white birch with the seeds. And those seeds are uh, relished by uh, siskins in particular, red pole siskins and goldfinch. 
will feed on the ripening seeds of birch trees. And here we have a pine siskin feeding on the birch. Aspens, beautiful sound, that nice little rustle you hear in the wind um, um, as, as you're catching that. Very stately tree, nice straight trunks, beautiful whitish green bark. It's attractive year round. Now some aspens will sucker like nobody's business and some don't sucker at all. So it's, you know, it's a bit of a, a hit and miss whether or not you happen to get one that loves sucker versus ones that don't seem to want to sucker at all. Um, the catkins in the spring of the year will be visited by pollinators, especially the male catkins. This, in this particular case is a female catkin, but the female catkins then will produce the seeds uh, that these finches will feed on later in the season. As I mentioned for maples, ignore Norway maple. We don't want Norway maples. Not when we have spectacular red maple. Um, um, and then in the Atlantic Canada or a maritime story, you also have sugar and silver maple to choose from. All very, very similar. They have these sort of reddish color flowers this time of year. They're in full bloom now. Great for early emerging uh, pollinators. Um, <clears throat> the sugar maples, more nodding clusters, but again, the pollinators will feed on those as well. Um, oak trees, not in Newfoundland. You have pin and red in the Maritimes. In this case, it's primarily the seeds. And in this case, it really is for squirrels, okay, and chipmunks. Um, squirrels and chipmunks are not native in Newfoundland. We have them here, but they were introduced, okay? So um, I don't have the same affection <laughs> for squirrels and chipmunks like you might in, on, in the Maritimes where it is a native species. But in this case, it really is uh, a plant that's primarily for um, these mammals. American beech, not in Newfoundland. It's a great landscape tree though, however. And the beech nuts are relished by evening grosbeaks, beaks in particular in the fall of the year. So it's a good food source uh, for these birds. Balsam fir, it's a great cover plant. Birds will nest in them like crazy native throughout those cones that are quite attractive, even though they're quite high up on the tree, um, are relished by crossbills in particular, okay? And pine grosbeaks will feed on those. Spruce, we have black spruce and white spruce throughout Atlantic Canada. In the Maritimes, you also have red spruce. Again, great cover for birds, great nesting sites, but those cones, again, are gonna be eaten by um, any of these birds that feed on the, on the seeds of, of these different conifers. Red crossbills, bit of an endangered, threatened species. So by planting any of these cone producing trees, you're helping them. Uh, white wing crossbills, very similar, okay? But they do, they're far more common uh, than red crossbills are. And their bills are specifically adapted at getting at those seeds inside the cones of the spruce and the fir trees. Uh, here's another white wing crossbill, the male, which is a very pretty, it's almost a raspberry pink color. Uh, pines, we have red and we have white pine, okay? And these are ju just as ornamental as growing an Austrian pine or a Mugo pine. Now, albeit Mugo pines are nice and dwarf, um, but you know, if you're looking for a large pine tree in your garden, why bother with Austrian pine when you can grow a red or a white pine instead? And again, these seed eating birds will get the seeds out of those once the seeds are ripe. White wing crossbill again, feeding on the seeds of a pine tree. Eastern larch, it's a conifer that loses its needles. So it's bright green in the spring when those needles come out. The cones are still great for these seed eating birds, but just look how you can appreciate those, that beautiful golden foliage that you see in the fall of the year when the, when the needles are starting to turn. Now, I'm gonna end off talking about hummingbirds. Now you have the advantage in the Maritimes that you have hummingbirds. They're very rare here in Newfoundland, but they, we do have them breeding. They only breed in the extreme southwest corner in Newfoundland. I, I don't know if they hop a ride in a ferry <laughs> and come across to Port of Bass, uh, but essentially most of the breeding ones we have here in Newfoundland are all restricted to the Codroy Valley in, in the southwestern part of Newfoundland. But, you know, hummingbirds, obviously hummingbird feeders are, are really important aspect, but there's lots of native plants, lots of ornamentals as well. Uh, that we can grow in our gardens to help the hummingbirds. But here are a few of the native plants that hummingbirds in particular do um, enjoy visiting. So spotted jewelweed, I mentioned that before, it's a great plant for wetland areas. And hummingbirds just are go mad after spotted jewelweed flowers. 
Uh, wild tobacco, not in Newfoundland, um, but you do have it throughout the rest of the Maritimes. Fireweed, in this case, this is um, a rufous hummingbird, but same idea. I mean, I just happen to have a picture of a rufous hummingbird feeding on fireweed, but our ruby-throated hummingbirds, which are the ones that we have here in um, Atlantic Canada, will also feed on fireweed. The wild currants that I mentioned, the blossoms are pretty tiny, but hummingbirds still manage to get a bit of nectar out of them. Canada lily, not found in Newfoundland, beautiful ornamental plant. Hummingbirds will, will relish this one for certain, for certain. Uh, bush honeysuckle, okay, nice sort of shade loving, uh, but it'll grow in the full sun as well. Um, it's a suckering shrub, may get a little bit invasive in the right place, but generally you can sort of pull them up where you don't want them. Uh, but those flowers themselves, very attractive hummingbirds, and also hummingbird hawk moths, which are oftentimes mistaken as hummingbirds, especially here in Newfoundland. And, but of course, you know, if all else fails, put up your hummingbird feeders, you know, um, and the hummingbirds will love it. But the great thing about the hummingbird feeders is that the hummingbirds oftentimes will feed at a hummingbird feeder or feed on the nectar of a flower for a short period of time. And then they sort of disappear for 20 minutes, half an hour before they come back to the nectar again or the sugar water. And during that half hour, they're fluttering elsewhere, they're feeding on insects. Okay, a lot of times you're feeding on uh, mosquitoes, black flies, things that we don't want around anyway. Okay, so they are very, very beneficial. Uh, and I'm really jealous um, about any of the people um, that are listening in this evening that have hummingbirds on a regular basis. I would love to have them in my garden. And I do plant plants for hummingbirds and I keep hoping that eventually one might turn up, but just hasn't happened yet. Okay, so here's the recap. Okay, so. If you have a phone, your phone ready there now, um, snap a picture, okay, of the list. Um, and that way, and, and also at the end of the, of the plant, I'll specify it's for nesting, is it for seeds, is it for pollen, is it for nectar, uh, to give you an idea, okay? So the, here's a recap of the trees. I'm hoping I've had that up long enough that you have a chance to snap a picture of it with your phone if you're interested. Um, also, this is being recorded, so it will be, uh, put online. Um, the link will be sent out so you'll have an opportunity to look at it again and, and jot down the information as well. Here's a recap of the shrubs that I introduced to you this evening. Again, with the whole idea, um, whether they're for nectar and pollen, are they good for fruit, are they good for everything, or are they a little bit more restricted um, as to which group of um, wildlife will take advantage of them. Okay, so that's your recap recap of the shrubs that were talked about. Here's a recap of the perennials. These are the meadow perennials, those that like the sun, uh, nice open areas. Most of them are different types of asters or related to asters because those are what the butterflies love, but the bees love them as well, okay? And that includes the native bees as well as, hon as honeybees. And I never really talked about honeybees, but you know, a lot of, of listeners here this evening probably may very well have um, honeybee hives, or maybe you have neighbors that have honeybees, okay? So we can help them out as well. We know the honeybees are having all sorts of problems these days as well because of, of diseases that are affecting them. Um, we're very fortunate here in Newfoundland that the main disease that honeybees get is not found here. So we're really, really fortunate. Um, and we're taking advantage of that because we have two beautiful hives uh, here in our botanical garden. And I suspect this year we'll be splitting one of them. So we'll be up to three hives. Um, <clears throat> And, and, and everything's wonderful for that. So here are your meadow perennials. Here are those if you want to put in a wetland situation. It may be just a roadside ditch. You might want to put in something a little bit more formal uh, with a little, in a little pond in your garden. You know, and there's lots of information there on the internet on how to recreate um, a pond on your property. As I mentioned before, if you can have a fountain or some sort of running water, recycling that, will help to cut down on the incidence of possibility of, of, of uh, mosquitoes going in there. Um, and if you're attracting things like frogs into your pool, they're gonna eat a lot of the larvae um, and, and keep any possibilities of West Nile um, at bay there, okay? So that's a recap of the perennials. And then here's a recap of the woodland plants. And one thing to keep in mind that I didn't mention before when it comes to these woodlanders, these are oftentimes what we refer to as ephemeral plants. 
So a lot of these woodland plants only bloom in the spring. It's May into June, um, and then they sort of disappear for the season. A lot of them literally go dormant by the middle of the summer because it's generally just too dense a shade underneath the trees for these things to, to uh, um, keep growing during the summer months. So a lot of times they'll go dormant. That's fine because what we're looking for here are those early emerging butterflies, the early emerging bees, and all these sort of ephemeral woodland plants are great pollinator plants um, for those kind of, for those particular insects. Later on in the season, they'll simply move out into the more open areas, be it a wetland area or be it a, a roadside meadow type scenario in order to get their food sources, okay? So that's a recap of all the plants. There was lots of stuff introduced to you here this evening. Um, it may be a bit overwhelming. I never talked about the Latin names of these plants. And normally that's all I mention are Latin names, but you know, um, we're a mixed group of people here. Not all of us have had uh, formal background training in recognizing the Latin names. However, however, I think it is important. Um, there's lots of information out there which does describe plants based upon the Latin names. So as was mentioned, um, I have written a number of books specifically geared for our region, specifically for Atlantic Canada. So there's the trees and shrubs in Newfoundland and Labrador, trees and shrubs in the Maritimes, then the wildflowers in New Brunswick, which really includes Prince Edward Island for the most part as well, um, wildflowers in Nova Scotia, and wildflowers and ferns of Newfoundland. Okay, I, I didn't include the ferns for Nova Scotia and New Brunswick because you have so many wildflowers. We just tried to get into that book. I just didn't have room to include the ferns. But in Newfoundland, we don't have as, as much of a variety. So I did have room to put in the ferns. So within those books, um, lots of photographs to help you identify the plants. I do not go into the specifics of which are good for pollinators or, or, or for birds or whatever, okay? So that's where this information that you have this evening will fill in um, the information there you, you may be missing there in, from the book in that regards. But the books are organized based upon the Latin names, the common names, um, so even though I only gave you the common names of this evening, you want to learn more about them, then you can certainly do a cross-reference between the common name and the Latin name uh, to get the information on those particular plants. So that's information. I'm ending it off with lance leaf goldenrod because if you're only going to grow one native wildflower in your garden, I think lance leaf goldenrod specifically is probably the number one plant. Bees love it. The lady emerging butterflies here is morning cloak or um, red admiral, sorry, um, in this particular scene. Um, and, and these pollinators will love you. So I think we're pretty good on our timing here. Um, that any great. questions that are there? Yeah, thank you so much, Todd. That was fantastic. And lots of great comments coming in. Thank you guys for your comments. And a lot of people really enjoyed that. Um, we'll just go to questions now and see what we have. Um, one person said, oh, yes. But in addition to seeds and berries, caterpillars are very helpful for birds. And that's definitely true for themselves and for their young. Really important to have tolerance for insects there. Do you have a visual of nesting boxes? Okay, we saw that in the presentation after that was written. And I should, uh, just while you're mentioning about the um, insects, one thing I didn't mention is that a lot of gardeners that are growing sort of ornamental plants um, are, you know, I said, don't go using pesticides, right? Because we always want everything in our gardens to look just prim and proper. But with the wildflowers, really, you don't want to worry about that. And if they get eaten by caterpillars, as that, as that person mentioned, that's fine and dandy, because it probably means that your particular plant is a host plant for that particular type of butterfly. Because I know willows in particular are very good host plants for a number of different types of butterflies. So you had to be tolerant. If your willow gets stripped, that's a good thing, because it means that you're, you have attracted morning cloak butterflies to your garden. Um, and then later on in the summer, your garden will be full of morning cloaks flying around doing their thing. So by all means, don't worry about these plants being eaten up, okay? We actually are encouraging you to have plants that are gonna be eaten. And there are, there are studies that show that, you know, birds sometimes need like six to 9,000 insects for one clutch of eggs, like they were so important. And you mentioned Norway maples being a non-native and our insects haven't evolved to adapt to them yet, so they don't go to them, so the birds don't want to nest in them. And so again, if you want birds in your garden, you want your native plants. Anyway, so yeah, so many great things you touched upon there. Are there native vines specifically for Atlantic Canada? Kathy's wondering. Yeah, there's. we don't have a lot of vines in our part of the world. Um, 
because the, the most common vine that I know in the, on the, in the Maritimes, you have a uh, blue clematis that's a, that's a vine. And of course, that's going to be good for, for bees um, in particular, because it's a blue flower. Here in Newfoundland, we have no native vines um, at all. So, you know, really when it comes to vines for your garden, you're probably going to have to rely more upon the ornamental types of vines. And if you are going to do that, honeysuckle is probably the number one of course, for hummingbirds, they'll they just go mad after honeysuckle, um, as do the um, hummingbird hawk moths will feed on honeysuckle as well. OK, um, so, yeah, so that's if you're going to introduce a vine, you're probably going to want to introduce one of the more exotic species instead. All right. And then um, what about lupins? Someone's asking about ah, the lupin. <laughs> OK, <laughs> so here we have a plant. It's not native. OK, so and we think I mean, and I had to I had to laugh because you go to stores and you see, you know, uh, Atlantic wildflower seeds and it's lupins. Right. But lupins are native are not say native are naturalized. That's the term are naturalized lupins are actually from the Pacific Northwest. OK, so does very well. It's a great pollinator plant. Bees love it. All the pieces. There's no doubt about it but I didn't introduce it, I didn't talk about it because it's not native, okay? So if we're gonna be purists here, <laughs> then we're not including lupins because if we're not purists, one of the best plants you can grow is dandelion, okay? So, you know, and here in Newfoundland, I don't know if you're doing it on the, in the Maritimes, here in Newfoundland, especially here in St. John's, we are advertising no mow May, okay? So don't go mowing your lawn in the month of May because we're encouraging you to let the dandelions bloom because they are such an important early source of pollen and nectar for these early emergent butterflies and bees. But that comes you know, with a caveat, right? So some people are not gonna be happy um, about you not mowing your lawn. But certainly here in, in St. John's, a lot of the roadside medians uh, will not be mowed. Um, in fact, a number of them are not mowed even in the summer and they're just filled. With different types of wildflowers. But, you know, so, but like I said, the purpose of this particular presentation was to concentrate on purely those plants which yeah. were here long before <laughs> we ever came here. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, though, I have dandelions and I harvest the young leaves for myself because they're full of vitamins as well. And there minerals. you go. So, someone exactly. asked when making a water feature, is city water okay? Um, for the most part, you know, what happens is that. You know, in the municipalities, they add chlorine to the water. Some places add fluorine as well. Um, but a lot of that chlorine basically dissipates quite quickly um, in the garden setting. So once that water gets in there, it's literally only there for seconds and then it's already dissipated. Um, so by all means, not a problem to use um, city water for your water features. Thank you. Someone's asking, I hear Virginia creeper is a great plant for bees, birds, butterflies, and other wildlife. Do you recommend this plant? I got one given to me from a friend and was thinking about purchasing five or six more to grow on our chain link fence. Yeah, so it's, um, most of these vines certainly will, birds will nest in them once they get nice and thick and tangly. Um, any of those kind of places would be great for that. Um, they do produce a berry, so some of the fruit eating birds will take those berries in the fall of the year. So yes, so it's, it's, it's a recommended, if you wanna grow those on a fence um, for privacy, beautiful fall color in the fall of the year. But if you really want to sort of intermingle another vine with those, as I mentioned, honeysuckle is a great plant because it's blooming in that season when the Virginia creeper might not be blooming so much. Um, and like I said, on, in the Maritimes, you have hummingbirds, they'll love it all to pieces. Uh, whereas hummingbirds are not really gonna go after Virginia creeper to the same degree. Okay, great. Someone says, I have a very tiny backyard. Can you suggest an evergreen that will not get too large? And I thought of a you. I don't know if you have yous out there or not, but what can you suggest? Yeah, so so I never included native you. Um, native you, essentially, it's only the, uh, the female fruit. The birds will eat the fruit on that. The rest of a you is actually toxic. So, you know, mm. I mean, it depends if you have small children or whatever. And our native yew is not, it's not gonna be a tree. It's only gonna be like a, a creeping shrub. So it's not gonna produce the same effect. So the only, the, the smallest native conifer is gonna be black spruce. Okay, that's the mm. one that's gonna stay the smallest in size. 
Um, if you're going to go to an ornamental, then you want to go to Serbian spruce because Serbian spruce also has a very, very narrow pyramidal growth habit. Um, so it would be recommended for smaller gardens. Okay. Um, someone's asking about wild grape. I know they can be problematic for trees, but they're also beneficial. So it's again, a balance. Yes, exactly. And I never thought about wild grape when we were talking about a vine because uh, we don't have it here in Newfoundland. So I was thinking I was Newfoundland centric there. But yes, and in fact, we have wild river grape growing um, here in the botanical garden and it's crawling 20 feet up into a spruce tree now. So it is problematic, but I can guarantee you that the berries will be eaten here in the garden. It's primarily the rough grouse that come in and eat the berries on our wild grapes in the fall of the year. So if you have the space, go for it. You know, but if you have a small garden, you might want to think twice. Okay. Uh, Vicky's saying no more May in New Brunswick as well. That's cool. No. And where would you source many of these plants? I know we have a native plant in, um, suppliers list on our website and I'll include that link, but I don't know, Todd, do you have any pre pre preferences or recommendations? Yeah. So here in Newfoundland, unfortunately, the um, whole aspect of using native plants in your garden has not really caught on to the same way that it has across the rest of the country. Um, so we have very limited source of native plants. We do propagate a few um, and have for sale at our botanical garden, those which are sort of the, the better ones. Um, and we've taught courses here about, you know, attracting pollinators and we often get our participants to go home with a native aster or a native goldenrod. Um, and oftentimes we, we supply the plant for them. I know in Nova Scotia, there's at least one if not two native plant nurseries um, so it's a matter of going um, online and because I can't remember what, who they are offhand. Um, and I know here in Newfoundland and soon to become available at a nursery near you, there is a young fella here, um, Matt Levesque, and he is actually collecting seeds of native Newfoundland pollinator plants and selling those seeds as being a pollinator mix. Hmm. And he's been doing that here now for a number of years. I'm not sure if he's actually selling them online. I know he sells them at one of our local uh, nur um, uh, nurseries per se, uh, Gay Seed or the Seed Company uh, that we have here locally sells his seed. But I just saw an advertising that he's now gonna be selling the seeds across Canada. So whether or not Halifax Seed Company in particular, um, which does supply a lot of material for Atlantic Canada, whether or not that's gonna be one of his suppliers, you might wanna contact Halifax Seed to see, uh, but I do believe that this gentleman does have his own website. So his name is Matt, M-A-T-T, Levesque. Um, and so just Google search him and see if you can find more information about that. But he has specific pollinator mixes and they're all based on native plants, which is fantastic because a lot of the, you know, other wildflower mixes that are out there are not necessarily native to Atlantic Canada. They may be native to Ontario or Quebec or the prairies, but not native here to Atlantic Canada, or they may not even be native plants at all, even though it's being sold as a native seed mix. Okay, so it's one of these buyer bewares. Yeah, definitely. Now, I, oh, someone's saying Cornhill Nursery supplies native plants. Okay, and I'm always grateful. If you guys know pl places to add to our native plant supplier yes. list, please send them on over. It would be very helpful. So I'll take note of that. Yeah. Perfect, now, that's yeah. the end of the, the questions that I saw in the questionnaire, but someone's saying Virginia creeper can spread out of control. Yeah, and anything that does tend to have that that, na that robust nature can do that. I guess you just have to keep an eye on things. And it's that balance with so many of these plants, right? That exactly. Yeah. And, and as I mentioned, like even some of the, na the native plants that I did recommend um, can be a bit of a garden bruisers, we'll say, right? So like fireweed, that can run like nobody's business if it's in a really, really rich soil. So it could become a pest in your garden. Um, most of the asters and the golden rods are actually not too bad. Um, they're easy to control. If they decide to get too large, you can sort of break away chunks off of them and sort of try to keep them down within size. Um, vines, vines are what vines are. And that's mm -hmm. the nature of vines is to grow out there and clamber over native, uh, you know, a neighboring uh, vegetation and that. So you always need to be a bit wary when it comes to introducing vines. Um, especially to a small garden in particular. 
Yeah, definitely. And do, do your homework with all the little plants. There's only so much one can say in an hour and there's always so much to know about them. And well, I'll say one last question because this person is asking shrubs for the shade. Now you did touch upon many shrubs. Can you think of any of those that were particularly good yeah. for the shade? Okay, so the uh, bush honeysuckle, the uh, deer villa, I'm throwing out a Latin name here now. <laughs> so bush honeysuckle will tolerate considerable shade. Uh, a number of the viburnums will. Now, just keep the caveat there is that you won't get as much bloom and hence you won't get as much fruit in the shade as you will in the full sun. But these, most of the viburnums are normally understory plants. So they will grow in the shade of other taller things like the beech and the maples and the oaks, okay? So viburnums in particular are good. Uh, cornus, and I never include a bunch berry because that's just a small little tiny cornus. Okay, the, the, the cracker berry, as we call them here in Newfoundland. Um, and that's a good pollinator plant as well uh, that you can incorporate into the woodland garden. But they like the red twig dogwood, uh, the pagoda dogwood. Those are great plants for, and that will tolerate considerable shade as well. Okay, now I've seen people actually have added a few more questions to the quest, the Q&A section. So how about we'll just tackle those last three and then we'll call it quits for the evening. And um, one thing, what to go under a large oak tree? Okay, so under a large oak, um, assuming that the canopy is up high enough, they at least get a little bit of um, side light, we'll say, lateral light getting in there. Then the viburnums, the cornices as I mentioned, uh, the bush honeysuckle will be good understory shrubs to grow there. Um, any of these ephemeral plants that I mentioned, the trilliums, the hepaticas, the uh, trout lilies, these are all plants which naturally would grow in the shade of the native oaks um, in that area. So those are the kind of plants you're gonna go with your ephemeral wildflowers for the spring of the year. And then later into the season, you're gonna be relying upon those understory shrubs instead. Okay, someone's asking, um, you mentioned the wild tobacco. Uh, they're also talking about cardinal flower and blue lobelia. I know you said you can't mention all the flowers, so I don't know if yeah. they're out that way, but what do you think well, about those? The thing is with the cardinal flower is not native, um, I think there may be very small pockets that exist in New Brunswick. Now, it may have spread around since then, but it, it was never originally found, we'll say, um, in any great amounts. Same with the blue lobelia um, in Atlantic Canada. But more than likely, it is a native North American plant, all these, and they will self-seed. If you have them in your garden, you've introduced them from a nursery, um, you introduce them to your garden, they will spread into native areas or natural areas, we'll say, um, in your neighborhood. But again, I just didn't mention them because there were not true and tried uh, necessarily native plants to our region. But as I mentioned before, a number of native plants from Ontario, the prairies, would still be great native plants to grow in our gardens here. Um, but again, it's just sort of a little bit beyond the scope of what we're talking about here specifically this evening. Absolutely, and it's definitely nice to know what truly is native and have that distinction and move forward from there. Okay, yeah. last two questions. Do you know of plants that repel Japanese beetles or that aren't eaten by them? Thank you so much mm. for this webinar. Okay, um, I, I can't comment specifically on that one because we don't have it. Knocking my table again. Uh, we don't have Japanese, be or um, yeah, Japanese beetle um, here in Newfoundland. And I know they do like to eat a lot of different types of plants. So I think your, be your best bet for that particular question is to go online, look for Japanese beetle resistant plants, and then do a cross reference from that list to the, the recap or the plants that I talked about here this evening and see what overlaps there are, and then select those plants accordingly. Great, and then the last one is Tansy came from somewhere else. Do you know where? From which, which plant? Tansy, it came from oh, somewhere else. Do yeah. you know where? Yeah, Tansy is a European plant, okay, which is Great. very well established here now in Atlantic Canada, um, including the Philan, we'll, we'll, we'll find big patches of Tansy. Butterflies like it, bees like it, but it is now basically, it's, it's the role, almost like a dandelion uh, or a lupin. It's a, a non-native plant, which has become very well naturalized um, here in Atlantic Canada. Great. Well, we're going to wrap it up there, but I want to thank everyone for their participation. Todd, thank you so much for all your incredible knowledge. It's been a real pleasure. When you talked about blood root, my face lit up. You couldn't see it, but we have our blood root 
blooming right now at our demonstration gardens around our headquarters. Okay. Uh, they're just so beautiful. So I love all those spring ephemerals too. So yeah. Okay. Well, well thank my you pleasure. So and I just hope that you know people get get some appreciation um, for the benefits of using native material um, in our gardens. And as I mentioned before, don't think you got to use just the natives, incorporate them with the exotics, try to get that nice happy medium going there. And if you have a big enough property, well then you may want to start to go more aiming towards the native plants as opposed to the exotics. Great. Well, thank you so much for all of that. And uh, again, we'll be sending a, an email out in the near future. I'm not sure how many days from now, because it depends on how much time it takes to get all the links ready and get that organized. It could be by the end of this week or early next week, but uh, watch your inbox for that. And Todd, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. You're very welcome. Great. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye, everybody. Okay. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye.